Welcome everyone to the uh, Precision Nanosystems Tea Time or webinar series. Uh, today we've got Cyril Van Erp from Pro Pharma Group um, and Cyril will be talking about the development with the end in mind, how to bridge the valley of death. So um, just to introduce the Precision Nanosystems team, you have myself, um, AJ Johnny and Richard Broadhead and we're both based out of the UK um, and we look after the northern part of Europe for precision nanosystems and based in Germany we have Jürgen Schmidt and Martin Rabel um, and they help support the central Europe region. So just before we get started, um, whether you're creating your nanomedicine um, at the bench level through your R&D efforts using a platform such as the Nano Assembler platform, and you're looking to scale up and get to preclinical development and ultimately to clinical applications. We do focus a lot on the chemistry of the formulation and the biological activity, but there are other things to consider um, in terms of all the regulation and the requirements around that. So what I'll do is I'll hand it over to Cyril to talk about those in a bit more detail. Hello. Um, thank you, AJ, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about development with the end in mind, how to reach the valley of death. Uh, my name is Cyril uh, Van Erp, um, and let's get it on. Uh, so what I'm going to uh, talk about today is uh, first an introduction of Profarma Group, uh, and then of me, so you know uh, who you're listening to. Um, then some general challenges in drug uh, development process um, based on actual data uh, that we have extracted from EMA and FDA databases um, um, on that it fails quite often. Um, and then um, the challenges that we see uh, with startups, um, then what the value of that is, what I mean with that. Uh, our solution, which is a target product profile, um, and then uh, how do we offer uh, that? Um, first, a Pro Pharma group. Um, maybe it's important. We are a consultancy agencies. We offer uh, uh, 60 plus unique services. I will give a few examples later on. Uh, we offer those on six uh, uh, continents. Uh, we have more than 1,200 consultants at this point. Um, and due to also a couple of services that we offer, sir, offer um, we have a lot of uh, native speakers um, in, as you can see, many different languages. Um, our, our core services um, are around regulatory affairs, life science consulting, pharmacovigilance, and medical information. Um, but that that includes everything from um, discovery um, to um, commercial uh, phase four. Uh, some services, and I think this slide is maybe a bit confusing, um, range over all these, uh, but a service like medical information is just for commercial, whereas a regulatory affairs, life science consulting and pharmacovigilance range over the entire range of uh, the life cycle of a, a drug or development. The 60 plus uh, services that we offer, I'm not going to list them all. Uh, this is something you can read. Uh, in your own time, but uh, if you are a startup, which is um, where this presentation is a bit focused on, um, these will be things that you have to deal with at some point. Um, so I put them here. Um, I am in the, um, oh yeah, this is uh, where we are. Uh, so this is a general statement, but uh, those pink things are not uh, broken pixels. That's actually the location <laughs> that we are. Uh, we have, have a few offices in the US and uh, scattered throughout Europe. And we have one office in, uh, in Japan and uh, one in Australia. Um, who am I? As said, uh, I'm Cyril. Um, 
I'm a managing consultant uh, within the life science divisions. I, I, uh, I had a group called Product Life Cycle Management, which uh, consists uh, in, in the EU. Uh, we, have, we have one of those groups also in the US, uh, but I had the one in the EU um, with list around 10 consultants that uh, manage uh, various issues uh, in uh, life cycle management, including uh, development. Um, I've worked at a lot of big pharma uh, in the past, but mostly in, uh, in project uh, uh, management uh, roles around pharmaceutical development and around uh, the production of clinical trial material. Um, um, and I've done that for 15 years now. Um, this, the, the meat of the presentation, just uh, to get everybody on the same uh, knowledge level, this should not be uh, uh, strange to you. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details between the differences between Europe and, and the US, just take my word for it. It is roughly uh, uh, the same. You do product development uh, and you have to go to an MAA, uh, a dossier that you have to file uh, at some point. This uh, uh, document, regardless of your product, in the end you have to uh, uh, deliver a large document which uh, has a, a quality part, a safety and an efficacy part. And I'm, this is really rough, but that's the basis of, of, uh, of the entire uh, thing that you need to uh, do in order to get an approval of uh, whatever drug uh, you want to bring to the market. Um, in US, it's a bit uh, the same, but and there are some small differences, but this is the general gist. Um, during those development phases, uh, they start with uh, thousands of ideas um, um, and some fail in preclinical or in, in, in development. Uh, then a few uh, uh, get into the phase one, phase two, phase three and even less uh, um, end up uh, with an approval. Um, but this is uh, the moment that you start to have uh, proper documentation uh, around uh, your quality, safety and efficacy. This is the moment that you have to have it really in place. Uh, but before that, you hand in uh, investigational files. Just uh, not to uh, uh, scare you, um, I took a few uh, slides uh, and, and, and this is um, from a study that I found that uh, combines FDA and e EMA uh, uh, data um, where you can see the probability of success moving from the different clinical phases. Um, this slide uh, suggests uh, that in the end, uh, your probability of success from moving all the clinical phases are around 9%. I have a next slide that takes a, a bit of a different data set that is specifically to uh, the EMA uh, tailored um, that talks about 13% uh, but makes a division in, uh, in, 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 uh, in different areas. Um, I wanted to keep this slide in, even though it's confusing, uh, around the 13% with the 9%, uh, because this has this very promising uh, uh, statistic on um, the chance that um, a vaccine makes it uh, <laughs> from phase one to phase four, which we are, I, th I guess we're all waiting on uh, at this moment. <laughs> so this is why I like to, to keep this slide in. Um, all that data that you previously saw is, is public data. Uh, mm, we know uh, that people do a submission for a phase one study, for a phase two, phase four, phase three. We don't know the reasons why they fail at a certain point or why they withdraw. We do know that uh, uh, once they go into an MAA, um, once they go for a, 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 a submission. And of course, we as Pro Pharma know uh, why they fail in individual cases, uh, but I wanted to also bring this to a general point uh, based on data. Um, what you see here is an overview of uh, uh, um, four years of, uh, of, of studies uh, that were tracked by the, by the EMA, uh, the European Medicine Agency. And uh, it says basically, 
why they are withdrawn or refused by the EMA. And uh, you have to understand that withdrawn means that after they tried, that a company says, okay, <laughs> we see why this is not going to work with all the questions that are raised based on the documentation. That if, so we are going to withdraw. So then the issues are known. And what I wanted to talk to you about is that, uh, and this is what we see a lot with uh, startup, that most of the time, uh, well, so first start, Clinical reasons, uh, uh, reasons around efficacy um, uh, and safety are most of the times things that we cannot fix. This is something that is inherently uh, related to uh, whatever product you want to bring to the market. If it doesn't work or if it's unsafe, um, then in some cases we can fix it, but most of the time it just has to do with the compound that you want to bring to the market. In the, in, the, in the case of quality issues, um, and this is what I was referring to earlier, everything that relates to um, uh, manufacturing, specification stabilities, uh, how you set up uh, your drug product, um, those are the second main reason why they fail. Those are things that you can fix. And the numbers that I've shown here um, also prove that most improvements are made on quality issues. Um, um, and that means that after that uh, um, they get fixed, non-clinical and clinical issues, they just remain unresolved because they cannot be fixed because it's inherently uh, the molecule uh, um, uh, that we're talking about. Um, and this is uh, what I want to talk to you. This is, of course, way at the end, but this accounts, and this is also our experience for all phases of clinical studies, most of the issues that we see are uh, uh, quality related issues where we think we can fix. Okay. Uh, next slide. Yeah. The, the, so this is just the introduction of um, the part where I'm going uh, with, um, it is very expensive, it's slow and it's very risky. Uh, as you can see, a lot of compounds uh, fail. In our experience, uh, a lot of those companies don't have resources and they don't have required competences. But most improvements are made in quality issues. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about on how to make sure that you don't get these quality issues in the first place. Um, so this is what, what I was referring of the value of debt, as shown by the numbers that I had before. That is an actual place, 10%, 30% uh, um, uh, makes it. All the other, uh, there's a, a lot of cash going in. Um, and depending on how you are uh, planning your development phase is uh, depending on how much cash you put in. I put here, um, what we see with a lot of startups is that they don't have and I will come back to that later, but I put a lot of cash in, in, in non-relevant uh, um, uh, parts in the beginning. And this is what we are trying to fix. We are trying to fix the valley of debt. Um, and what are the uh, challenges? Uh, what we see is that um, they struggle with really setting the, the, the right priorities, uh, having the right cost expectation for certain parts of, 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 of your preclinical or preclinical work. They suffer from inadequate practical knowledge, how to implement this in a manufacturing environment. Uh, they suffer from um, really understanding uh, what their patient group is and how to uh, uh, use the development uh, to focus on that patient group. Uh, they, they, they struggle from not having the right focus. Um, and then, of course, there's always strategic partnership. As, as a startup, you cannot do everything by yourself, uh, which often means that uh, you're making the wrong decisions. So our, our solution to this is beginning with the end in mind. Uh, normally, this is what you have. You have a beginning, you start planning, and you have an end. If you translate that to a pharmaceutical uh, uh, world, you start with a target product profile. Uh, based on that, you make a drug development a roadmap uh, with the patient in mind, and that is the end. Um, that is the general concept uh, that we as ProPharma try to do, but it's not something that I made up. It is really... Um, 
this is Stephen Gove. He, he wrote a lot of, lot of books around effective uh, uh, living, but it is also something that the F FDA and EMA have written about. Um, if you want to go back into that, there's a document about the FDA around TPPs. Um, but it is what I said, it's aimed at the labeling and that's the technical term for the FDA on what do you want to achieve with your product. Um, um, and uh, that relates a TPP into a Q QTPP and then uh, you have control over your development, you have focus. Uh, the idea of this is that um, you really uh, begin with the end in mind. You look at, okay, what is needed in development to, to enable uh, commercialization? Based on that, you start this target product profile. Um, but of course, there are uh, uh, what is su supposed working mechanism of the product uh, in the patient. What are non-clinical studies need to support a UTPP claim? What characteristics should be met for the product? And all those questions come about. You need to sit um, with a large team uh, within your company, uh, and, and we can support you uh, with that to get also the right people in this uh, uh, in the discussion to get aligned on what your target product profile is. It is not a document that I can make or you can make by yourself and then just shoot it into the organization. It is a way of awareness. It is aligning within the company what you want to do and how you want to achieve that. Because based on this, you start to plan out uh, your next phases uh, for your development. What kind of information is in, in, in this document? And this is just, uh, um, we have of course templates for it, but this is just a feel of um, what should be in there. And uh, there's of course uh, uh, really characteristics about the product, uh, how it should look, what the formulation, the volume, the potency, the dosage, what kind of shelf life it should be at what temperature and these type of things. Then what I was talking about that comes back in, in, in the dossier, you should have a safety profile in it, uh, which translates to impurity profiles, to uh, manufacturing residuals, to viral inactivation removal, microbial assurance, all those things come in your safety profile. Then of course you have to think about the patient. How are they going to use it? Uh, um, what is the timing of the treatment? Are they going to use it every day? Do they take it home? Is it only given in the hospital? Uh, um, but does it have to come out of minus 70 storage? Uh, how do you prepare it? Uh, um, but then on top of that, I think it um, this document also brings a good idea to the people that understand the business, the marketing people. What are your clinical milestones? What do I want to achieve with what product at, at what point? And which marketing am I targeting? Is, is, is this uh, a general leukemia of a very specific type of, of, of leukemia? And how big are, are those patient groups? Because that has an impact on how uh, uh, big your manufacturing batches will be. And all those things you have to take into account because otherwise you're drifting in the dark. Um, and then a very important one, uh, which is often forgotten, you need to think in advance what your cost of goods uh, uh, should be. And this is more important um, because during your development, uh, um, your freedom to change diminishes. Uh, um, during phase three, you have no freedom to change. Uh, during phase two, you have some freedom to change, but very little. So that means that in the beginning, you need to plan on where you're going to uh, get into that funnel of, of less freedom to change. Um, of course, during development, your knowledge and your GMP level and your product value and your cost go out of the roof. Uh, but the less freedom to change is why this TPP is so important. Um, then based on this target product profile, uh, you define a drug development roadmap um, that defines, okay, what kind of formulation studies do we need to do? What kind of upscale, scale-up studies do we need to do? What kind of CMO do we need to select? What kind of in vitro studies do we need to do? Your clinical development needs to be developed. What kind of safety studies, efficacy, PKPD, in vivo, toxicity? You have to come up with timelines and then 
a business strategy and again keeping in mind your cost of goods uh, what kind of supply chain uh, i've i've had examples in a uh, uh, where they think didn't, didn't think about a supply chain and and products that have to be shipped around minus 70 uh, that have a use basis for use are uh, are a challenge um, and those are things you have to realize in advance and don't um, come up with later um, how does this translate so you have your target product profile then you, uh, you come up with your early product development you start with this TPP then you do your process development it goes back to your TPP and you discuss it again this is a living document that keeps on moving um, uh, all the time and you have to go back to the document and have to have, to have the same discussion with the uh, same people based on that uh, you set up uh, or on your process develop, you set up a control strategy that is something that the FDA and the EMA definitely want because you cannot say we just made three batches so we're good you have to have a control strategy and your development has to be based uh, on that and then you can think about oh how am I going to uh, produce this uh, on a commercial scale. Uh, so before that, you need to understand what kind of scale-up steps you want to do over your process. Uh, so you can think about a technology transfer. In the end, up you end up uh, uh, with a process risk assessment, which you use in your uh, submissions. Uh, and you have a conform uh, uh, product. Um, and you are ready for your inspection. So this is how our solution is. Um, uh, you have a value of debt. I think that is established. Uh, a lot of uh, products fail, mostly fail on, on, on quality related issues or that are at least things that you can fix. Uh, with bringing a target product profile, uh, we can help you with make a, a drug development roadmap. You get a clearer vision and expectation of your product within in your entire company because that's what we often also see there's disalignment between the business the clinical and the product uh, uh, the scientists uh, there there is less risk of failure uh, and there are less financial risks it ac it actually accelerates your drug development um, you get a better understanding of your process and you have an effective control of your program um, things that it, it, it has to deliver in the end. Once you have a TPP, you can start on your drug development roadmap. Uh, then you can slowly go into your IND and it moves you uh, to the next phases. Um, so this is where we start, all the challenges. How do we solve that? I have a nice uh, transition. Uh, we have an extensive expertise network uh, of these 1200 consultants. We can help you with the communication within your company. We can help you with clear cost estimations related to your TPP and to your drug development roadmap. We can understand uh, uh, what you need because we've done this uh, several times. Um, and we can give you focus in development. These are the things that how we offer it. We do this, usually we start with a workshop and then we implement it. And depending on how large your company is, we can have an help desk contract. We can uh, have a project manager that helps you develop, or we can bring up subject matter experts uh, that in the end uh, deliver clinical trial material with suitable documentation, which is the end goal if you want to get approval and go to the next phase. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Cyril. That was uh, very interesting. Lots of uh, lots of food for thought in there. So uh, I think a lot of the audience will be uh, involved in this process at, uh, at various stages. Very interesting, very informative. We very much appreciate you uh, joining us today. And thank you to uh, everyone who attended the, the webinar. There will be another one of these Tea Time webinars in two weeks. Um, that will feature Sophia Antimisaris of the University of Patras. Um, we very much look, look forward to seeing you all then and thank you all thank you